Welcome to Club Soda's Mindful Drinking Festival. We're online, global, and as always, absolutely free. Hi, I'm Drew, and I'm one of the co-founders of Club Soda. And I'm Laura, the other co-founder of Club Soda. We help you change your drinking in ways that help you live well. So whether you're looking to cut down, stop for a bit or quit, you can find what you need from podcasts and books and courses on joinclubsoda.com. This festival, we've brought you an amazing lineup from over 100 people from across the world. And our programme this time really is global. Every day starts Down Under with me, Sarah. As well as organising the festival in Australia, I spend my time looking for alcohol-free alternatives and tips for people who choose not to drink, but who still want to live a social, fun and adventurous life. And I'll be wrapping up each day here in the States. I'm Amanda, your US festival host and coordinator. And I'm also a mindset coach who helps women change their relationship with alcohol so that they can start living their most authentic life. Each day with a rolling program of inspirational panels, conversations, social events, and opportunities to discover new low and low alcohol drinks. So whether you want inspiration to change your drinking or to connect with other people, or you want to discover and enjoy a new low and no alcohol drink. The Mindful Drinking Festival is for you. Cheers. 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 Well, cheers. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to How are you? How are you? Mining, uh, Mindful Drinking Festival. My name is Jason Quinn and I'm from Etch Sparkling. Welcome to the Aussie edition of Men Drinking Mindfully. So I'm joined by a wonderful uh, panel of guests from across the country. Uh, we'll introduce ourselves uh, around the table in a moment. Um, but firstly, before we uh, kick off as, as a panel, I'd just like to encourage anyone who's having a look at us from uh, Facebook or YouTube, please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, we'll attempt to... Um, to answer those as we as we have our little chat, um, so so welcome to interact with us throughout our discussion. Uh, so what I might do is, uh, James, if uh, if we could ask everyone to um, just introduce yourselves and tell us a couple of minutes about who who you are and and what you're about. James, welcome. Well, yes, thank you. So I'm James. I am one half of the NA guys with my best mate on the other side of the screen, Sunny Applin, and um, I've been three. Or 370 or so days um, alcohol free, um, and we are on the search for. Still love my beers, so we are hunting for the best non-alcoholic beers that we can find. Thanks, James. Say that's a good segue to you, mate. Yeah, well, uh, as James said, we're sort of good mates from school, and we used to sort of be, oh, well, not, you know, like probably heavy binge drinkers, I would say, and. Um, as time's gone on, you know, we've got, I've got a family, James has got one coming. Uh, we sort of sort of to start to try and stop drinking as much. And yeah, uh, James went sober last year and I've sort of jumped on the bandwagon. So I've been off the drink now for about eight and a half months and yeah, enjoying a few uh, non-alcoholic beers. I've actually got one at Clinton's today, the Sobar. Um, and yeah, it's, um, you know, been a life-changing experience actually. Wonderful. Th thanks, Say. Luke. Welcome. Hey guys, how are we? Good. Uh, yeah, so my name's Luke Weirty. I'm down here in Melbourne. Um, interesting place to be in the world right now. And um, I'm the owner of Birdie uh, down here in Melbourne, which is a bar and restaurant that focuses on uh, Australian products, um, exclusively using Australian spirits and uh, doing a lot of fermentation and distilling and that sort of thing. And yeah, low and no alcohol is, is a big part of our offer, uh, especially lately. So um, currently we're running a, just running a, a delivery service because we're not able to open uh, due to lockdown, um, which is pretty interesting, but yeah. Thanks, Lee. Uh, Clinton, we uh, you might be able to screen see folks on the screen. We're just having a few little challenges on the uh, strength of the Wi-Fi up there, we believe. So, once Cl uh, Clinton, have we got you back? Welcome, Clinton. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, far away. Yes. Yeah. My name's Clinton. Uh, uh, based here on Yugambeh country on the Gulf. Um, you know, got long standing with uh, Sonny there as well. He's probably seen me at the worst of my times uh, when I was, you know, 
heavy Gold Coast drink, honey animal, to be honest. Um, I've been on, uh, sober for six years, sober beverages, uh, just going on three years. So up until very recently, we were Australia's lead non-alcoholic craft. And it's great to see some others have now come on board. So, Thanks, Clinton. Uh, so I'll just briefly introduce myself as well. My name's Jason Quinn from Etch Sparkling. We're on uh, Boonarong country down here in the Mornington Peninsula. Um, and uh, I, my wife and I started Etch uh, last year. Um, I had a 23-year career making wine on the other and uh, uh, producing and, and uh, in wine business and, and marketing. So I've jumped from the uh, producing alcohol, alcoholic drinks across Australia, New Zealand, Asia Pack and even in France, um, and have really enjoyed uh, this opportunity and uh, the, now uh, producing wonderful non up drinks. Um, my, uh, I'm 18 months um, of sobriety and uh, really enjoying this uh, new phase of mindfulness existence, not only just drinking. So maybe um, what I might do is just start, open up the, the chat What's, what's everyone's thoughts on what does mindful drinking mean to you? Oh, I'm happy to start um, if you want. Of course. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, for me as, as a father and, you know, uh, sort of I was getting down. I wasn't drinking all the time. But I'm not the sort of person who ever drank during the week or anything like that. But, you know, uh, last November we had a couple of big weekends in a row. I went to the races one weekend and then... My birthday was the following weekend and just, you know, backing up on the Sunday and trying to look after my kids and do things like that just was sort of the thing where I went, you know, I don't want to do that. So now I've found by not drinking, I'm so much more, you know, in the moment with my kids. Um, I've got a lot more energy, uh, all that sort of thing. We can sort of, you know, Sunday comes around, I'm not sitting on the couch going, oh, I hope they don't ask me to do this. I'm sort of going let's go do this, you know, like, let's go for a ride. Let's go do whatever. Let's go for a walk on the beach. We all went for a walk from Burley to North Burley and back today, you know, like things like that. Whereas before when I was, you know, not feeling trash hot, I'm like, geez, I hope they're happy to sit around and watch the iPad, you know. So mindfully drinking for me has just made a big change with my, you know, whole family situation. Luke, what do you think? What's your What's your... Yeah, for me, uh, very much, very much the same as Sunny. I, I'm a, a fairly new father. I've got a two-year-old at home, um, but I think it's just about balance for me. Um, working in in bars and restaurants for a uh, majority of my adolescent life or adult life, um, it's very easy to fall into that trap of finishing work, having a drink going out, burning the candle at both ends, and then it's almost easier to keep that cycle going than, than stopping it. And, yeah, I fell into that cycle um, years ago uh, when I first got into hospitality. Um, and, yeah, it was very hard to break it. But I must say, especially now that I'm a father, um, I really enjoy having like removing alcohol from my personal life. You know, it's a uh, it's a big part of of uh, of my life. Obviously, I've built a career around um, around alcohol, um, and so for me, it's just about moderation and and sort of keeping it in check and um, realizing that you know that uh, there's more to the there's a bigger picture. Um, when I was younger, uh, alcohol was a big part of my life, but in for negative reasons as well. Um, my father had uh, some uh, very uh, tough uh, struggles with alcohol as I was younger. Um, so I've always found it quite ironic that I chose uh, to, you know, basically build my life up um, from alcohol when I, I was watching, you know, my father and, and basically the, the worst parts about his life and what was sort of tearing his life down was, was due to alcohol. So um, I think I learned a lot from that experience um, and sort of, you know, I guess saw that, you know, alcohol is something that you have to control, otherwise it will control you. Absolutely. Yeah, I think um I think for um for me the, the term mindful drinking sums it up um perfectly because when you choose 
not to drink, you're actually engaging your mind and you're making a conscious decision to be present. Alcohol, drinking alcohol is mindless drinking and that's what people resort to is doing it to numb numb the mind and that sort of thing. And I think mindful drinking is just, um, you know, you're making a conscious decision and originally I was, I was worried about how I was going to handle the situation um, and, you know, by not drinking and now it's, you know, I'm proud to, to say, no, I'm not drinking and that's, you know, my mind is very clear. It's going to be clearer than yours in the morning. So in that sense, it's just I think it's such a fantastic term, mindful drinking, and we should label alcohol drinking as mindless drinking because that's literally what it is. Mm -hmm. Escapism, yeah. Yep. Exactly. Um, Clinton, have we got you on audio there, mate? Yeah. Yeah, can What's you your... see me still? Yeah, yeah, fire away, yeah. mate. What's your thoughts on mindful drinking? I'm still on. Um, yeah. yeah, so for me, mindful drinking is about actually questioning when you're drinking, why you're drinking, and what you're actually getting from drinking. Um, and it kind of follows on from what James was just saying. You know, if, if you're drinking to cover pain, issues, traumas, negative life events, um, then you're kind of just running. And you can only run for so long before it'll catch you. And that's what I found in my life. You know, I'd, I'd spent 15 solid years trying to run and it just hit me hard by the end of that. You know, my body was worn out, my mind was worn out, I was spiritually screwed. Um, and I had to get to a point where, you know, it took my my boy at the time was six years old and, and put it on me. He just said, Dad, can you stop drinking silly drink? And I just went, yeah, mate, you've got me. And that was it. So that was the moment I started being mindful about the consumption of alcohol. It took a six-year-old to wake me up to myself. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I, I relate to, um, James, your comment about the mindless piece, but also wouldn't mind my, my story is about the progression of that. So I think when we're talking about mindfulness and awareness of what alcohol can do to you, my, my example is... Um, you know, uh, as someone with a good career, um, how I had a job, I've got a wife, I've got kids, I've got, um, you know, I'm reasonably fit looking. Um, at the time, I wasn't quite so, but, uh, you know, two cars in the garage, house, toys. So my life looked pretty rock solid, right? But I think the, the thing about that escapism, um, for me what happened was that uh, the social side um, and the mindless side converted to medicinal at some point. And I can't actually recall when that happened, but it happened. And so when that converted from uh, social to medicinal for me and, and that mindlessness was taking over, took over, um, that was that process of shock and awe and, you know, people talk about the the yets and the, the rock bottoms and all that sort of the, 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 the that, those things that happen in your life um, and it, it took that for me to become aware and for me mine full drinking is aware drinking and that's what's been the real blessing for me just in my 18 months of sobriety and every day just gets better and better and better um, and it's all of the examples Sonny playing with the kids uh, the awareness of what what this is doing to my life is is so much better um, the other thing about mindfulness I just wanted to throw out there for, for tonight too is that um, I, Clinton's all, all about uh, na um, Native Australian plants too and, and, and I think for me mindfulness is broader than just NA. It's all about taking progressive categories and um, it could be native plants, it could be other other points of difference that I think this, the community, the beverage community and consumers are now looking at. So... It's a really exciting space. The health and well-being space is exciting and mindfulness is really exciting. What what about some of the um challenges that we face? We it's it's pretty trendy at the moment. Um sober, it's, it's the it's the new new um you know, rock star celebrity to be sober. In Australia, we 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 love a drink, we celebrate with a drink, we do business deals with a drink, we commiserate with a drink. 
what are some of the challenges that we still face as men, rural and city-based? What are some of the challenges that we face in Australia? Well, we've we've probably all been like you know, Clinton and James. We all know each other. You know, like we we grew up on the Gold Coast, and we've all been that bloke who someone's like, you know, I'm not drinking. You're like, what the hell is wrong with you? You know what I mean? Like we've all we've all said it and done that, and that for people our age, like I think the younger generation and us are a bit more open to sort of sobriety a bit, whereas you know, sort of our age, where you know, all around the forty age and. You know, from the time you left school to it was it's part of being a man almost going down the pub, you know, going down the pub and having a few beers and having a punt on the horses and you know, like it's almost like if you don't do that, you're not part of the crowd, you know. Um, and so to take the step and not drink, now you have to have, you know, a bit of gusto, I think, in you to be able to stand up to that and um to sort of try and, you know, like the thing our page myself and James, we'd, we'd love for people to, you know, realise that you don't have to be a drunk or you don't have to drink to have fun, you know. And, but I actually used to think that I had to, you know. I, I, that was sort of a, a probably a big part of who I thought I was. And then as time went on and I sort of – I was still drinking a little bit, but I wasn't, you know, drinking all the time. I sort of – it's just become less and less of your life and there's plenty of other things to do other than, you know, actually going down the pub and, you know, sitting down – don't get me wrong, like if there was more options at the pub where you can actually go and have a non-alcoholic beer and things like that, like I'd probably, you know, quite happily go there and still sit there every now and then with the boys and do that sort of thing. But for now, there's not enough sort of options in Australia, I don't I don't think, you know. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are watching from UK and I believe there seems to be a lot more, you know, options over there. I think, you know, a lot of the pubs at least stock one sort of non-alcoholic beer or whatever, so at least you can actually still be part of the team in a way and sit there and have a drink and be social and, you know, mm. not feel like the bloke's sitting there having a lemonade. Mm. I understand there's some there's a recent study uh, about if the options are available, consumers' choice will actually go down the healthier option. So you're right, it's probably one of a big challenge. Do you think, Luke, um, coming from the, you know, your, your experience across bars and hospitality and, and, and venues that you've owned and managed, what are your thoughts on availability versus choice? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely much better these days than it was. Um, even just around like the the drinks that I've served in my the venues that I've run. Um, it, yeah, I think in in the early days it was pretty much a lemon lime bitters, and um, that was about the the only non alcoholic option you had. Uh, to now, we're even like specifically fermenting and infusing things for uh for drinks that are to to be honest just as elaborate as any alcoholic we drink drink we have on the menu so um there is a lot more option these days and i think it goes a long way for sure um but i think the biggest thing is like the shifting culture like sunny was saying like uh and and yourself was saying like it is seen as like cooler to be you know not drinking and and you know maybe being that sort of outlier um yeah, like I grew up on a, a, a small country town in Coffs Harbour um, and I, I grew up uh, surfing and a big part of the surf culture was, you know, you go out and you get smashed at night and and, and whatnot. And, uh, you know, if you're the one guy in the group of friends that hasn't finished your beer as quick as the rest of them, everyone, uh, you know, looks at you and you have to down your beer. There's like a lot of peer pressure around it and you have to be, um, quite a strong-willed character to um, go against that. Um, I get, you know, I was always, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that I'd never really let that peer pressure get to me. Um, but I, I, I saw a lot of people, and, and especially people in my peer group, that they did let that pressure get to them. And, you know, it's it, it catches up with you in, in the end. So I think the biggest thing that contributes to changing this is, is the culture around it, um, for yeah. sure. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Just um, to give you a bit of a backlog on Sonny, he was a pretty big superstar of sport going through school and he used to rock up to parties with a six-pack of Pepsi and we used to peer pressure him so hard that he didn't drink up until year 12 at school and we peer pressured him so hard to drink that he then drunk and then became a drunk 
And now I peer pressured him out of it and go the other way. <laughs> and now he's a superstar athlete again. But definitely that culture going through school. And we went to an all boys school. And it was, you know, from even year 12 when you're 17, the weekend was time to party. You'd finish your footy and then it was, you know, it was into it. And that's the culture that we were all brought up on. And I think, like Sonny mentioned before, at least it's changing a bit now. I think the younger kids, um, you know, are, aren't so wrapped up because they're so health conscious now as well. I mean, the size of these kids coming out, they're all going to the gym. They're all fit as, and they're not out to go out and get hammered like we used to be. Um but definitely having the options for us and having for the younger kids as well, when they do go out to clubs and whatever, having that non-alcoholic beer option is definitely going to be the, the key moving forward. So, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, and someone's just asked, um, why aren't yeah, we using yes. Why don't guys open up about drinking? And I think because of that peer pressure with um, from your mates. But if I have any advice for anyone who is worried about that, don't you, 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 I, I thought my friends were going to give me a lot of hard time and they didn't. They were quite supportive. And once I actually admitted and they all knew how loose I got, I was caught drinking midweek and I, I was hopeless on the booze. Once I said to them, I've got a problem, I'm stopping, your mates were supportive and you'll only find the mates that give you grief about not drinking are the ones that are worried about their own drinking. So advice for anyone thinking about wanting to stop, just say it. Just say, I'm not drinking, I've got a problem, back off, and your mates will be supportive. Do you know what I reckon, James? Um, I have similar experience, and, and I reckon that's one of the biggest myths to bust. Uh, first, in early days of sobriety, I was really worried about the shame mm. of of having to say publicly, "I've got a problem with alcohol." Uh, in Australia, that's that is a really con- considerable thing to admit. Um, but I reckon, but trying to bust that myth, I reckon if we we as producers are making these great drinks and when you're at a barbecue, you're at a dinner party, you've got a good quality drink in your hand, um, people tend to look past it, you know. Um, so uh, you can, if there's anyone out there that's thinking of, of that, yeah, let's bust that myth. Yeah. I, I think it also I, mean, I think it's very situational and as well. Sorry, Clinton, far like away, mate. Um, you know, yeah, I was saying it's very, it's very situational and and environmental based as well. You know, we're we're based here on the Gold Coast. Everybody sees the Gold Coast, unfortunately, still as as party central. I can tell you right now that the Gold Coast was the very last place in Australia where it was, ex- and that was only in the last month. So it's really difficult in certain parts of the country to then make choices because the choices just aren't available and that's because the support from retailers isn't there to open up those options for the public uh, and just up in brisbane then there's far more acceptance and far more availability therefore people are far more likely to make better choices for whatever reason at whatever time hmm. so so that's probably one of the biggest challenges then broadly across australia convincing that base about from a supply chain and availability that there is um, people demanding these drinks. We know statistically that beer and wine consumption in Australia is declining. We've got generational change. Um, The older generation are wanting to be healthier, uh, live well. Younger generation, likewise. Um, So I think that once we personally, and, and actually the statistics back this up, that with the decline of some of these categories, Retailers still want to generate revenue, and people are buying something. Um, so, let's these forums like this weekend shouting the message out there, and trying to take that message from city to other to brought you know places like the Gold Coast, which is not far. Um, there's consumer demand. Luke, Luke, what's what, what's your experience from from a bar perspective about consumer demand of this category versus your traditional alcoholic demand? Uh, I guess um, the way we sort of at, at Birdie uh, and and the way I've approached it over the last few years have sort of, has sort of put me in a position where we've created, I guess, our own sort of uh, culture around this, um, and that is even extending into our alcoholic offering. So actually, with our alcoholic menu and our cocktail menu, we don't list the alcohol that's used; we just list the flavors that are used. Um, and I started doing that a few years ago out of frustration of uh, 
uh, people coming in on a Friday night saying, give me the strongest drink or give me the, you know, all I drink is rum or, all, or I don't drink gin that makes me cry. Um, and I, I got frustrated with this because we were putting in a lot of effort um, as a team to create these uh, quite intricate drinks. Uh, and then someone was coming in just saying, yeah, I just want to get smashed. Give me the strongest one. So on the list, we actually removed that. So we just put some maybe hints as to what uh, what uh, spirits we were using. So if it was rum, we would put sugar cane. Um, if it was gin, we would put juniper. And then all of a sudden we found a huge shift of customers choosing based on flavors that they would like. And then that even extended to the non-alcoholic offering. And because there was no separation between, okay, on the alcoholic uh, menu versus, you know, the non-alcoholic drinks, people were still choosing based on flavor. So even people that were out drinking alcohol, they would sometimes just on basis of flavors that they were like, choose a non-alcoholic drink. And mm -hmm. quite often, you know, it, it, it went sort of under the radar that that was even the case, right. you know, and that for me was a, a great win for us because people were enjoying a drink for its merits on flavor rather than just alcohol. So, I mean, to get back to your question, I, I guess, you know, like I said, we're, we're not exactly your average pub that, you know, has those, those standard uh, non-alcoholic versus alcoholic options. Um, but, you know, we've, like I said, changed that culture. I think for me, when I go out to a pub um, these days, Melbourne in particular, it, it's getting a lot better. Um, but there's still a ways to go, I think, you know, to, to promote that. Um, like, you know, being in London, seeing like some extensive uh, uh, non-alcoholic op offerings, I, I guess I'd cite um, probably Seedlip is probably a real game changer for that, you know, choosing a spirit um, or something close to a, what is deemed as a spirit um, that's non-alcoholic um, and, you know, injecting that into the the template of if you're if you want a gin and tonic you're having this um i think that's great and I, you know if we can see more of that then that's going to change the culture for sure mm. that's a wonderful case study of an example live example thanks for sharing um I, i've got a question here about um advice on people who are wanting to cut down and still have an active social life and i guess i i, I think this question's coming from the broad base of people that are may, maybe not like me that I can't touch alcohol anymore. And, and um, but there's probably this whole mass of people, the 80% of people that consume alcohol that might be thinking about cutting down. Yeah, the, so the question is, um, what advice do you have for people who want to cut down but still have an active social life? Are they separate or are they mutually exclusive? Can you, is boring. Mix is it so up. <laughs> Far away. No, I think people can mix it up. I think, particularly in the craft beer scene, I think people can easily mix it up now. You know, people can gr go and grab a mixed six pack, grab three of their favorite craft beers, and grab three non alcoholic craft beers, and you just intermix them as you're drinking throughout the night. And that way you're moderating. So I think that's a really easy way. So it's quite easy now in that space. And I think we're starting to see that more like in the other spaces of alcohol now. So there's better non-alcoholic wines out now. There's a whole range of non-alcoholic spirits being produced now. So I think we're getting more availability for people to be able to more easily mix it up and not feel like they're actually missing out. And to be honest, nobody around them will probably know. <clears throat> um, another question just come through about men. Are men more inclined to look for an AF beer or are non-elk spirits of interest too? What's been your experience there, gents, as, as uh, the NA guys reviewing products? What, what's <laughs> that, I guess that I guess that depends on what you're um, what you normally drink. drink. What, yeah, what you normally drink. So um, I was I'm a beer drinker um, after work. You know, um, you know, can go and have a go and have a beer. So beer is my choice. But you know, towards the end of the night, I always try and chat, switch over to the Rumbos or something and wipe myself out with a Long Island iced tea. At the end, um, but um, so yeah, so I think I think for me at the moment it's the beers, and I think um, making a jump for guys to go from drinking to go to a I'm not drinking, um, and I'm not drinking a non-alcoholic spirit might be a bit too much of a jump for people because they still um, I'll probably worried about that mate. So say was if you just switch to a beer, 
um, a non-alcoholic beer might be an easier jump for people. But definitely both markets are, are going to be huge um, and they should be because I think, you know, there's guys that um, their um, their um, toxin is a, is a spirit. You know, they're a sucker for vodkas or they, you know, they've got a problem with the, with the rum. So, you know, any any area is um, is great and there's some fantastic ones in each area. Yeah, yeah. For, and it, for me, I, I never drank sort of, it wasn't a spirit drinker, so I was sort of a beer drinker, but I would, I'd drink. You know, if I did, was it like a Jack Daniels or something like that? But for me now, I, I'm just happy to go for a beer because I, I don't, you know, like Jack Daniels, as James sort of said, was the thing you finish off on to wipe yourself out. Whereas if I'm having a couple of non-alcoholic beers now, it's just to be social or to sit there or just like, you know, I've had a hard day at work, crack a cold one. And it's not like the sort of drinking side of things is is not what it was before where I'm drinking for seven hours straight, you know what I mean? And you're switching from this drink to that drink and, you know, so I might sit down and have three, you know, non-alcoholic beers or something like that. So it's not, um, for me, the spirits hasn't been a thing, but, you know, I guess if, depending on what people are coming from is uh, what they're going to sort of, you know, go for on mm. the non-alcoholic side. Mm. You had a few vodka sunrises in your time. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> You long on ice tea. I've got you. a range. Of, <laughs> I've got a range of all the the liars liquors in in my cupboard, you know. And and if my wife and I have got a special occasion or something, or we're having a nice dinner or something, then we'll make a cocktail or we'll make a drink out of that. Like we had to go to our fiftieth last week, and we made espresso martinis, non alcoholic espresso martinis, and they were awesome. Um, we were jacked as on caffeine and had caffeine headaches the next day, but um, other than that, you know. <laughs> It was a great supplement. We still felt like we were getting to have something a little bit fancy because we were going out for a fancy occasion as such. So thinking about um, thinking about the future in Australia and uh, if this is cutting edge, this whole mindful sobriety piece, what are some of those next steps? We've spoken a little bit about distribution and footprint, a little bit about changing culture. Any other thoughts on... Um, what are the things that we need to drive and change as industry leaders, thought leaders, to actually make a, sh a shift in that Aussie culture? I think it's um, it's just getting it accepted in the, uh, you know, as a general thing. You, and, and it's going to take a while, but getting the culture in, out of the Australian way that you drink and you drink and you drink. You finish work, you drink. Once we can change that and it can be just acceptable and almost like, oh, Oh, you're having a drink is the is the the weird thing to do by having a drink. That that's that's when we when we've got where we want to be. But I think it's just more so becoming an accepted thing, and that will come from our you know our leaders, our sports heroes. So these young so the young guys coming through that are 13, 14 now see their idols, you know, not drinking. It's they, they don't see them hammered and passed out and doing all these stupid things in the press. They're sober. And that's the way they look up to those guys. So I think once we start getting our our stars and our celebrities taking a stance and 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 happily promoting it, I think is the key for, for our sort of celebrities to say, "I don't drink," and, and be proud of it. Then that's when I think we'll start seeing the change. Maybe we'll get to a point where we'll see all the drinkers out on the veranda with the smokers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all, all, all fighting each other. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, there's some pretty big commercial shifts. What you're what you're saying there, James, and I guess that's where um, this long long lead time might take place over building brands, distribution, and then um, outcomes for for business. Because there's still a lot of a lot of things to change in the background around legislation and commercial realities of, of, of the industry too. Well, if you remember, like when light beer came out, there was sort of like you know. You're having a light or you're having a gold or something, but then it become that you know, people had to have a light beer or a mid strength on tap, you know, have to have it. Like, why can't there be a non alcoholic version that they have to have, you know, for the drivers, for whoever, you know, like that, that would be the ultimate, really, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I guess that's that's uh, that's a part of that change. That's consumer driving the change, forcing the change. Uh, Clinton, what yeah, do you I think also like having. Sorry, I think also like having people like yourselves, like anyone that's committed to the cause of 
uh, putting just as much effort and passion and commitment into non-alcoholic offerings, you know, and, and develop, developing them in terms of uh, flavor and, and, you know, having something that you would honestly put forward um, next to its alcoholic uh, alternative and say, this is just as good. You're going to get just as much in terms of the flavor and, and, and whatnot. Um, and I think that it goes a long way into changing the culture. So we're already, you know, well on our way there. And so I think, you know, it's, it's a matter of, uh, you know, once that uh, starts changing, then the general consumer starts catching on to that as well. And I think we're already seeing that. Certainly, um, looking at just for different premium on-premise places where they're matching degustation menus um, with non-alcoholic wine degustations to specific non-alcoholic, which is just another great advancement in menu creation and people seeing value um, in in the venue. I actually had a, a great, a couple of great experiences going to some amazing restaurants. I went and ate at uh, Noma in Copenhagen. Uh, my wife was pregnant at the time um, and she took the non-alcoholic pairing and I took the wine pairing. And uh, halfway through, I was wanting to go back and t taste her uh, non-alcoholic pairing. I found it actually much more interesting. Um, so yeah, it, it, it can be it can be definitely just as uh, rewarding. Mm -hmm. I bet she wasn't finding you much interesting <laughs> as a as a new one. <laughs> no, that's that's yeah, that's commonplace. That's always it. <laughs> hey, Clinton, what's yeah. your experience been with um you know three years of, of sober? What what have you observed in the yeah. last? It's uh, tricky. We're stuck in this grey area at the moment where we don't actually fit into any category. Um, which is good at times and it's very problematic at others. So there's a lot of work, work on our side and then there's a whole bunch of unknowns where we don't know if we're just waiting to get tricked up by some piece of government legislation that, it, that nobody out there actually knows about. So we don't actually fit into, as a non-alcoholic craft beer, we don't fit into soft drink and we don't fit into alcohol. So the legislation is extremely loose uh, and that makes it tricky. There's also a lot of confusion around the terminology itself both and, and, and producers. So there's producers who are claiming to be um, alcohol free when actually they're less than 0.5 and, and actually a legislation issue. Um, mm -hmm. But it's confusing for the consumer. So if you've got somebody who's completely AF um, mm -hmm. And they don't know that there may be those trace elements of alcohol in there. That can be really problematic. Um, so yeah, there definitely needs to be a lot of work done in that space. Uh, I think you know some of the the issues we've seen with kombuchas and kefir waters and stuff like that over the last couple of years really brought to attention for governments the issues with low alcohol drinks and and um, non alcoholic drinks. So there was a lot out there claiming to be less than 0.5. And then when being tested, they'd had secondary fermentations were as high as 2% on cases. So I think that we'll probably see some crackdowns around us in that space as craft non alcoholic beer producers and other non alcoholic uh, drinks producers, just to ensure that what we're putting on our labels uh, is what's actually consumed. I wouldn't mind just raising a point at, at this point that um, that's that's really interesting for us in the community that have pushed, gone to the well a few too many times, so to speak, and are completely zero, zero now, um, in that this can actually be a little bit dangerous for, for those people that if there is a 0.5 or a 0.1 or, or whatever, it's going that, that can trigger them into um, old behaviours and, and that it can be quite dangerous. So I guess... I just wanted to flag in this discussion that, um, you know, we're talking about bringing the broader masses into this AF space, which is great, healthy, mindful drinking, and that's 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 true. But just what if there is people watching that, um, you know, there are resources out there, just really be careful and consider what you're drinking for the right reasons um, before you head down that path because if you do classify yourself or you're not classifying yourself yet as an alcoholic, there are... Uh, they can trigger you. You know, and, and James would probably back me up on this. More of it is uh, 
trigger is going to be than what actually is in the can, to be honest. Um, so we know that an overripe banana has got more alcohol in it than any of my products. Oh, I, I don't deny that. Past. Yeah. Well, if we go down that line, they're just as likely to be triggered by over the percent of what's on the label. So that's why we really need to be cautious of what's actually on there. So people do have the opportunity to be aware. To make So I think uh, I'll, I'll probably try and finish Clinton's sentence off there. I, I'm, th I'm thinking where his heading was around the, the responsibility of the producers to be clear on on packaging and and, um, and accountable on recipe and, and, and stability, all those sorts of things, which is absolutely true. So consumers uh, uh, know what they're getting. Um, so we've got, a, what have we got, five minutes to go. That's the five-minute warning banner coming up. Um, so at this point, I guess I wouldn't mind, uh, let's do a bit of a wrap-up around the grounds, just a few minutes about, um, your, yeah, your, your hopes and aspirations for the future with, for, for um, mindful drinking. Um, I'll go first. I... Um... I hope one day, like Sonny said, it becomes mandatory that every place has um, non-alcoholic beer um, and that our fabulous producers like Clinton keep making amazing non-alcoholic beers um, and it just becomes the norm to go out and have non-alcoholic beers. My advice for anyone um, wanting to quit is to seriously put it out there. Put it out and say, I don't drink. Don't say I'm doing dry July because you know you're gonna, it's going to be a very wet August. I don't drink. Once you say that, it's the best liberating feeling you can have. And once your friends hear that, they know to support you. Um, that's my bit of advice. Put it out there to the universe and it'll be no problems at all. Thanks, James. Sonny? Yeah, look, as I say, me and James are sort of from the same thread, mate. Um, but, yeah, you know, like as long as um, there's options out there, I think the people who uh, – I think also what Clinton was trying to say before was – you know, if, if you have issues with drinking and things like that and maybe non-alcoholic beers might not be for you, you know what I mean? Um, so you don't want to start drinking non-alcoholics and start picking up the real thing, um, whether or not it's, it's more so that action of having a drink. So I think uh, that's sort of what he was trying to touch on there. Um, but, yeah, look, hopefully that with Australia, it starts becoming more and more accepted, you know. Um, we just love for, yeah, more, more places to stock non-alcoholic beers. So when I... I've been out for dinner with my wife a few times lately and we sort of get there and everyone's having a drink, whatever, and there's just not an option. You know what I mean? Like it's, the ladies quite often have a, you know, a mocktail or mocktail or whatever they're called, you know, and whereas for me, I'm not a mocktail drinker, you know, I don't sort of want a little umbrella in my hand and a nice little bit of orange. I, I'd like a beer, you know, so our, our big push for, for us is to try and get that, you know, accepted in you know as many venues as possible. Yeah, I guess uh, from my end, like uh, I think, you know, probably uh, I keep banging on about it, but it's like changing that culture and especially in the the, uh, in the industry that I'm in, the restaurant and bar industry, um, you know, treating restaurants and bars or treating bars specifically as a place that, you know, you would go to have more of a, an all-round experience rather than just based around, uh, purely around alcohol. And it starts with the industry as well. Um, there's a big... Uh, I see it as a big problem with the bartending industry going in and they call it the bartender's handshake by giving a shot over the bar and whatnot. Um, it's really dangerous. Um, I've been a part of it and I've, you know, I've instigated it um, and, and encouraged it in the past. And I, I see it, I see it as a, a very dangerous culture. So stopping things like that and, you know, encouraging, you know, people to think about bars uh, a little bit differently. You don't go to a, you know, a fine dining restaurant, let's say, to like stuff your face. Um, you, you go there for the, the holistic experience, I guess. Um, so treating bars can offer you that experience as well, but also creating a fun atmosphere as well. It doesn't uh, start and end with a drink. You know, it's a it's about the company you're with um, and, and the you know the hospitality side of it. Absolutely, Clinton. What are you, what's your thoughts on hopes and aspirations? Yeah, my my main hope is that the real stronghold connection that we have between 
sport and alcohol uh, will wither away in Australia. I think it's going to be really hard for us to get, I guess, a collective swell of more mindful drinking happening when there's such overwhelming influence um, driven by the connection of sport and alcohol and that, and that that is that is allowed to be and I think that's the big step that we need to make. I mean, we did it with cigarettes 20 years ago. I think that's the next stance that as a country we need to. Thanks, Clinton. Well, for mine, I might just add that um, I'm grateful that uh, there's five blokes around a television screen right now talking about their acceptance of um, the wonderful category of mindful drinking and alcohol-free. So one of my hopes and aspirations is that just builds and continues and that there's more of us. Um, the more that we talk about it, the more that producers make great drinks and provide wonderful hospitality venues and, and, and occasions at home, uh, the more that people can connect authentically and that's what it's all about um i probably also wanted to just mention that for resources that uh for people who are might be thinking about getting on the on the journey of sobriety there's some wonderful resources online um in australia hello sunday morning uh sober in the country for rural smart recovery aa of course um so there's heaps of networks of on um and re resources and support if you're thinking of getting on the journey of um, sobriety, that's wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we as, a, as a group look forward to being on the journey too. So I think I might give that a bit of a wrap. I guess um, just to finalise, maybe how can everyone connect? How can consumers connect with um, you, you or your, and your businesses and what you're doing? Uh, if people want so to see us, us drinking beers, the uh, they can just <laughs> go to the NAR guys on um, on Instagram and then they'll find us there. Sober.com. Uh, Sober.com. Uh, and then uh, we're Birdie Melbourne uh, or Birdie Melb on, on social media and, uh, yeah, Hopefully we'll be able to open uh, sooner rather than later. We're just going into a, a, a another pretty heavy lockdown. So, yeah, wish us luck. <laughs> All the best, Luke. And for me, of course, uh, etch. Oh, hang on. There we go. Etchsparkling.com.au. So thank you, gentlemen, for a wonderful discussion. I hope everyone uh, got a lot out of that. I, I certainly um, really enjoyed having a chat. And uh, all the best to to uh, everyone for the rest of the Mindful Drinking Festival. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.